In the last class we started looking at isotope labeling and we saw that there are different methods, different ways to do it. Uh, we can do the biosynthetic incorporation of isotopes which is done as shown here uh, in bacterial cells, yeast and mammalian cells. You can also extract the protein from insect cells. But remember these are all recombinant DNA approaches meaning you take the DNA of your protein of interest and that is actually cloned into the organism. So, you are creating a copy of the DNA of the protein into the organism. So, we can do this either in bacterial cells E. coli which is the most popular approach or you can do it in yeast insect or mammalian cells. There is another approach where we do not actually need the cells at all because when you grow cells you have to supply it with nutrients, you have to monitor the growth of the cells, you have to harvest the cells and then you will also have to extract the protein from the cell and purify. So, that is uh, the approach which we did do in the cell based approach that is in this the first approach then you use bacteria or yeast or mammalian cells. But if I, I can use another approach which is called as cell free synthesis in which we do not need any organism like here uh, which we saw yesterday briefly the idea here is that whatever is needed to make a protein inside a cell those materials can actually be taken outside the cell and you can mix uh, with chemicals and actually get the protein synthesized in isotope label form. So, here you do not have the hassle or the problem of growing the cells and monitoring their growth, extracting from the cells and purifying. The protein comes out in a pure form of course, slight purification is needed, but not as extensive as here and also here you can make a protein of only your interest. So, here what happens is if I grow a my protein or if I express my protein in a bacterial cell what I am doing I am actually uh, over expressing or making my protein in large quantities inside the cell which we will see shortly how it is done. But in addition to my protein the bacteria or the yeast or insect or any of these cells are actually making their own protein as well because they have to grow. So, at every step of their growth they are actually making not only our protein of interest which we have cloned into its DNA, but it is also making its own protein also. So, therefore, it is actually not very cost effective or not very efficient because all we need is our protein of interest, but instead we are making the cell make all the proteins of its own along with our protein. So, now we will see shortly that this is not actually a very efficient approach. Uh, and this is also now in, in recent times is very useful approach. In fact, this is the only way to get proteins if you cannot express in any of these. For example, there could be many proteins which are uh, toxic to the cell, they may precipitate inside the cell and so on. So, so those kind of proteins you have to use this approach uh, alone only. So, this is how basically cell free synthesis has become very popular in recent times. Uh, and with there is another approach which of course, as I said not very rarely which is rarely used that is chemical methods of modification. So, you can actually synthesize a peptide or a protein if you know the sequence and if you know the sequence you can actually take choose your amino acids and accordingly also you can use labeling you can label it. So, we will not go, go in detail into this approach we will basically look at these two in this course. And in, the, in this particular we will look at bacterial cells in more detail because that is the most popular and cost effective approach whereas, yeast, insect and mammalian become very expensive if you have to label the protein. So, let us see how we can do this in bacteria. So, there are varieties of labeling schemes different types of isotope labeling which is possible. So, you can see there is this is just a dozen of them listed here, there are more in literature which are known. For example, you can do uniform C13 labeling this is the most standard thing. Here what we do is in this approach we basically the entire protein chain is labeled with C13 and N15 uniformly which means every amino acid of the protein amino acid residue every atom carbon and nitrogen atom in every amino acid of the protein gets converted to C13 and N15. So, there is no distinction between amino acid type for example, alanine versus glutamine versus glutamic acid etcetera everything is labeled uniformly across the whole protein with C13 and N15. So, this is the most first basic approach 
which people do. The second way uh, of labeling is you can do selective labeling here. So, selective labeling basically means you choose an amino acid type which you want to isotopically label. For example, let us say I want to label only alanine in my sample. Why would you need to do that? We will see that uh, shortly. It helps to assign, simplify the spectrum, make the spectrum less complex. Or you can choose to label only let us say aspargine or arginine or lysine in a particular protein. So, in such cases we need to now do another approach which I will, will see how it is done. But in such cases only that amino acid type means all arginines in a given protein will get labeled with C13 and 15 if I want to label arginine. If I want to label alanine I will do in such a manner such that all the alanines in that protein and only alanines no other amino acid in that protein will be C13 and 15. All the other amino acids will be C12 at natural abundance and C914 natural abundance, but only that particular amino acid which we choose can be labeled selectively with C13 and N15. So, we will see as we go along how we can achieve that. A third way of uh, uh, selective labeling is actually the opposite of the first one here opposite of this one. So, here we are doing the reverse. So, we use the word unlabeling. Unlabeling meaning uh, which is also actually referred to as reverse labeling in the literature. What basically it means is here we are choosing the other way round. We choose a particular amino acid which we do not want to be labeled. So, we shall let us say alanine again as an example. Let us say in uh, all the alanines suppose I have 7 alanines in my protein in my protein sequence and suppose I desire to unlabel only alanine means I want alanine to remain C12 and 14 in natural abundance but I want all the other amino acid in that protein to be labeled with C13 and 15. So, you can see this is exactly the reverse opposite here we chose a particular amino acid to be labeled all the others to be unlabeled. Here we are choosing a particular amino acid to be unlabeled and all the others to be labeled. Again why would you need to do this I will see as we go along it very much helps to simplify the spectrum uh, not only that it is a very cost effective approach compared to this approach of selective labeling. So, another option is fractional labeling and here what we do is here we want only about let us say 10 to 15 percent of the carbon in the entire protein to be labeled. So, it is not 100 percent labeling it is about fractional labeling fractional meaning about 10 to 15 percent. Again there are various reason why we need to do that and we will see that soon. Uh, deuteration is the most next important isotope labeling approach in which we replace all non exchangeable hydrogen in the protein by 2H. Now, what are non exchangeable? Those which are attached to CH carbon the CH protons typically. So, these are non exchangeable whereas NH, OH in the protein they get exchange they get exchange with water whereas CH, CH2, CH3 they can be deuterated. So, therefore, that is one approach. So, there are again different types of deuteration in a given protein. Uh, we will not look at it now, we will see it when we come to that topic. And there is another uh, labeling scheme where only the methyls are specifically protonated, but all the other uh, protons are replaced with deuteron and C12. So, you see here what we are going to do is only the methyl of every any amino acids which are the amino acids which are methyls is alanine, methionine, then you have valine, isoleucine, threonine and so on. So, these are the amino acid which have methyl groups for some of the these methyl groups we will keep it as CH3 that means we will keep C13 here and proton here, but all the other hydrogens in the protein will be changed to 2H and why do we need to again do that? The reason is methyls are very interesting moieties in proteins they are very strong in NMR. So, their signals are very highly intense. So, very useful to have methyls uh, as CH3 that is carbon 13 CH3, but all the other protons are not so useful and we can get rid of them by deuteration. So, we can retain only the methyls as protonated and all the protons again remember when I say all the remaining proton I am meaning only the non exchangeable the exchangeable that is amide OH NH they remain always protonated I am assuming they remain protonated. 
So, that and methyl will now get remain protonated in this scheme number 6, whereas all the non exchangeable CH carbon protons are now replaced with these two that is this is a natural abundance and deuteration for that particular proton. So, we can do this as I said for several other types of labeling. Uh, similarly, we can do the same thing for aromatic amino acid. In aromatic amino acid, I can have specific C13 proton labeling, whereas the remaining background that means all the aromatic amino acids will have carbon 13 proton in their side chain, but all the other remaining protons will get deuterated. So, this is basically another approach where we can use this. Um, there are other combinations, other uh, labeling approach which will not go into detail in this course um, because these are more advanced level of isotope labeling schemes. Uh, we will basically try to cover this first 6 or 7 of them as we go along. There is another very interesting thing is here number 11. Here what we do is suppose you have a multimeric protein for example, you have a monomer a dimer or a trimer of a protein. So, what we can do is let us let me show you this with a picture here. So, I am referring to this labeling here. Suppose I have a protein which is existing as a dimer. Okay. So, this is a dimer. What I can do is I can specifically label this part with C13 and keep this as C12 that is natural abundance. So, I can do that trick. So, once I have this one, one portion as C13, other one as C12, then there are a lot of experiments I can do to look at this molecule. So, this is another way to label a single chain that means, this is another one chain, this is another chain, they are joined by non covalent interaction because it is a dimer and when one of the chain only I am specifically labeling with C13 and the remaining I am leaving it as C12. So, this is possible to do with different approaches, we will see that uh, and so on. So, we will let us start from the very basic uh, first one that is uniform C13 and 15 labeling. How do we do that in again remember we are looking at E. coli. So, all these labeling schemes will be done in E. coli. So, we will see how we can do that in a bacteria. So, the question is out of this all this uh, material uh, labeling schemes which I showed earlier, how do you decide which one is good for you? So, all depends on these three factors number one what is that sensitivity you are looking for. Okay. So, if you want a very good sensitivity then basically you have to choose a particular type. For example, you are looking at very high sensitivity you have to deuteration is the best approach. You have to deuterate all the non exchangeable so that you get rid of any relaxation contribution and that is helps to do that or you can look at resolution. Suppose you want to have only a certain signals you want to suppress signals from some amino acids and you want to keep signals only from some other amino acids selectively. So, that means you want to resolve the signals from different amino acids then you need the selective labeling or selective unlabeling scheme which I mentioned. So, that helps you in getting good resolution. A third thing is the cost it is actually remember this cost of labeling is very high it is not very easy to not very inexpensive it is expensive to label proteins with carbon 13 and 15. Uh, and deuteration. In fact, if you want to deuterate uh, in Indian currency today, it can run into lakhs of rupees for making one sample. So, you can see it is a very costly uh, approach, but sometimes there is no choice for us we have to spend that money to make our protein otherwise we would not be able to study that protein. So, cost also matters when it comes to what kind of labeling scheme you want to choose from the list which I showed in the previous slide. So, now let us begin with the very simple idea of how we can express protein in bacteria. So, this is a general scheme this is nothing to do with what kind of labeling you are going to do isotope labeling it is a broad idea of this approach. So, this is called cloning or we can also use the approach recombinant DNA approach. So, what we do is the following. So, this is a picture of a E. coli cell and E. coli if, uh, if you recall uh, it has two types of DNA in its cell. One is called the chromosomal DNA, another is called the plasmid DNA. This plasmid DNA is a small circular DNA, which as you can see looks although not exactly circular, but it is a closed loop. So, this is electron micrograph of a real plasmid. So, now that plasmid is shown as a circle here. Okay. So, what we do is typically we take this kind of a plasmid, we use the word plasmid vector. Okay, so, vector is the word used. So, let us say this is an example what is called a pet 
vector. These are different vectors available in literature in, in, uh, in commercial market. So, one can choose a particular vector again depends on many factors. Uh, so, we let us say you have chosen one vector of your interest or a plasmid of your interest. What we do next is we make a DNA the gene which encodes our protein. So, now remember a protein comes uh, we know the central dogma of biology DNA is transcribed to RNA, RNA is translated to protein. So, basically proteins come from finally from the DNA. So, DNA means you have the code genetic code for a DNA. So, uh, sorry for a protein. So, every amino acid in a protein is coded by 3 nucleotides in the DNA that is a triplet codon principle. So, we what we do is we take the amino acid sequence of our of our interest. So, remember we should know the sequence this is something I have been telling in the previous class as well. The most important requirement for any NMR studies of a protein is that you need to know the sequence amino acid primary sequence of that protein without that we cannot do anything much. So, once you know the protein amino acid sequence you can generate a gene or a DNA corresponding to that protein that means it will be the complementary it will create a DNA which will code for that protein using the triplet codon idea. So, you take that gene the DNA what you do is you insert into this vector what so what we do is we break this here ok. So, we can break it at some place particular place it is not arbitrarily it is depending on where the operator and so on are located, but you break the DNA you insert the gene of our interest our protein into the cell oh yeah, sorry into the vac plasmid and then you can join it like this this is called ligation ligation means you have joined the two ends. Now, once you have joined the plasmid now looks like this and our DNA of interest is sitting in the a particular location. So, what we do is take this plasmid and we put it inside the cell like this here. This, this is called transfection or transformation. So, we transform this plasmid into the cell it basically the cell now contains its own circular I mean its own chromosomal DNA plus it contains the DNA plasmid which we have inserted into the cell. Now, what do you do next with this? So, now we have the cell containing our gene of interest ok. So, now next step is you grow these cells in a particular medium ok. So, this particular medium we call it as a minimal medium this is required for isotope labeling. Uh, so, the minimal medium basically contains a carbon source. So, remember a carbon is an energy source. So, we need the bacteria to grow. So, if you want something to grow it needs energy and energy basically comes from carbon proton glucose essentially from glucose. So, bacteria can grow on a glucose. So, you need a medium that means in which it has to grow and that medium will should contain a carbon source. Typically, we use carbon glucose that is glucose. Now, that source can now we can buy from uh, companies either labeled carbon or unlabeled. So, unlabeled basically is standard glucose which is available very routinely we use in the laboratory or you can buy a special glucose which will have C 13 labeled. So, that is carbon 13 labeled glucose which also is available commercially. Of course, this is the expensive part this is not very uh, this is a lot expensive compared to a standard glucose that is unlabeled. But if you want to label with C 13 we have to purchase this carbon 13 labeled glucose. So, that will be the source of carbon means any carbon in the whole of the cell will come only from that glucose there is no other source of carbon which will be given to the bacteria. So, every carbon in that bacteria whenever it multiplies has to come from this carbon. So, that means every carbon will be C 13 because the glucose is itself C 13. So, when glucose itself is C 13 labeled every carbon in the cell of the bacteria will start getting labeled. You also need a nitrogen source because remember we the cell the, the ammonia that is NH 2 the amide of every protein in the in the cell has to come from nitrogen. So, how do we do that we have to supply that means our medium should contain a nitrogen source. So, what are the typical nitrogen sources are listed here is ammonium chloride, ammonium sulphate or ammonium nitrate. Again remember these have to be in the labeled form means I should take N 15 ammonium chloride, N 15 ammonium sulphate or N 15 ammonium nitrate 
if I want N15 labeling. But if I do not care for N15, I want a normal protein with N14 abundance, then I can choose a regular ammonium chloride or ammonium sulphate or ammonium nitrate. Okay. And if you want the deuteration to be done additionally, then you need a source of 2H. And what could be that source? The source, there are two sources. Number one, the glucose also should have the protons in the glucose should be deuterated. So, CD glucose, carbon 13 labeled deuterated glucose. And second is, remember the bacteria, the minimal medium is made in water, that is H2O. So, if I want to deuterate, I need to now make use D2O, not H2O, because D2O is a source of deuterium. So, this is how we can do for deuteration, we will see that as we go along. So, this is a list of different carbon, uh, source of carbon which are used in labeling. Some in bacteria, the most popular is glucose or pyruvate is also used certain times, but succinate and glycerol are not so popular. Uh, so, we will stick to glucose in our case when we look at our examples. So, again I repeat the glucose which we use has to be either C13 labeled if you want carbon 13 labeling or it can be a regular D glucose which has C12 as a natural abundance. Okay. So, these are how, how we have to basically go about. We have to take this, I go back to the previous slide. We take this cell, okay, and of course, we will not have a single cell, we will have a lot of cells, a colony of cells and that cells are now grown in a medium. So, we put the cells in a medium and start growing them. So, let us go through these steps uh, one by one. So, what is the, the point here? The point here is how are we able to make those labeled protein is because look at this chart here. This is a very standard schematic biosynthesis pathway taken from biochemistry textbook. You can find this in Leninger, biochemistry by Leninger or biochemistry by Stryer. These are the two most popular biochemistry books. The idea here is that you have, you start from a labeled glucose source that is the or unlabeled that is the energy source and it gets now into different pathways throughout the cell and you can see that different amino acids get synthesized based on the different intermediate metabolites. So, these are all metabolites and these are all metabolic pathways. So, you can see that alanine is coming from pyruvate and so on, serine, glycine, cysteine are interconvertible here. Uh, the aromatic amino acid comes from shikimate pathway which is a very specific pathway and so on. So, one has to understand, one has to uh, know these pathways in case suppose let us say I want, do not want the protein to make aromatic amino acid, I do not want the bacteria to make aromatic amino acid, I want to supply it from outside. In such a case, then I have to stop this pathway here. Right? So, this kind of approaches are needed to be known so that we can see which pathways re result in which amino acid so that we can control that pathway and we can control the synthesis of those amino acids. Okay? So, this is very useful when you look at isotope labeling of selective amino acids that is selective labeling. So, here is another example, a few more examples of what are the different metabolites, intermediates. So, these are intermediate metabolites as shown in blue color which are generated in the cell and then they give rise to amino acids and each of these amino acids further they get converted into different amino acids. So, you can see this here phenylalanine, tyrosine, phenylalanine can give rise to tyrosine or it can directly come from here. Similarly, isoleucine and threonine, threonine is a precursor for isoleucine especially the delta carbon and so on. So, this has been taken from this book biochemistry by L. Stryer. So, the idea here is basically to understand that how amino acids are synthesized that is biosynthetic pathway in the bacteria. So, that we can control how we want to label. Suppose, I want to label only glycine, can I do that? Then in that case, I have to label serine because serine will give rise to glycine. But now, if I label glycine, serine also gets labeled. Similarly, cysteine also may get labeled if I try to label serine. So, you can see that selective labeling very much depends on how selective are these pathways. Okay. So, we will see that as we go along and we go in deeper into this. So, this is let us start from uh, now a typical protocol, a typical protocol basically for over expressing the proteins in bacteria. And again, we are uh, our idea is for labeling here. So, we will see from the labeling point of view what, what is the procedure that we follow for isotope labeling for NMR studies. So, you can essentially start 
from S transformation transformed plasmid. So, this is what I mentioned that you take the plasmid vector of your choice, you put the DNA of our interest into insert that into the plasmid and after insertion you take this entire plasmid put it into the cell inside the cell that is the transformation. So, we choose a typical bacterial strain which is written here BL21 DE3 you can refer to all the books and they will show this particular strain why and so on there are many reasons you can refer to the test books for those details. But we that strain is a um, typically the more popular strain which is used. So, once you have this bacterial cell containing this plasmid the next step is to basically plate it on a an agar plate. So, you can see here if you look carefully you can see these white spots here. So, what are these white spots? These are the colonies, colonies means collection of bacterial cells. These are not individual cells, individual cells of course, we cannot see with our naked eye, but this is a collection. So, you can see what has done is this is a plate, you can see this is a petri dish. On a petri dish we have an agar media and the same medium that is our uh, minimal medium on the agar plate okay, and that and the bacteria is grown on that plate and what does not grow like a liquid state, it grows like colonies, it develops into small small colonies. And now one thing is here very important point is that you have to you need a marker for selection. What do you mean by a marker? Marker means suppose I am growing this bacteria cell in a medium, how do I prevent the other competing bacteria in the same medium to grow because remember bacteria in our in our world is very ubiquitous means everywhere bacteria is there it is there in our body it is there on our hands on our everywhere in the in the in the, the laboratory so whenever i put a medium i take a medium even though i i will sterilize the medium means i will autoclave the medium i will make it sterile still bacteria can come from anywhere it can come from the air and so on so that means if i am growing the protein or sorry the cell of my interest which has my plasmid i can still have to prevent any other bacteria coming from contamination to grow, I should not allow the contamination to grow. So, how do I achieve that? That can be achieved by using a specific marker meaning let us say I take an ampicillin an antibiotic, am ampicillin is a well known antibiotic, antibiotic means it kills microbes or bacteria. So, if I take an if I in this DNA suppose I have a another marker that means ampicillin resistant gene is there for the bacteria. So, that means my bacteria becomes resistant to ampicillin, but the one which is the other contaminant may not be resistant to ampicillin because that is coming from natural sources it is not engineered like this, this is an engineered bacteria. So, you see actually in a way we have engineered it to become resistant to ampicillin which we can do very easily, but the other cells which are not part of this or contaminations are not actually having resistance to ampicillin. So, when I grow in a medium which contains ampicillin like this agar plates, the ampicillin will kill all the contaminants, it will take get rid of all the contaminants and only the bacteria of my interest that is the cells which are having this plasmid which is contains the DNA of my interest and it of course, it is resistant to ampicillin only that those cells will develop and make become colonies but all the other contaminations are gone. So, I can be very sure that all these tiny spots which I am seeing here are actually coming from the bacteria of my interest which contains the plasmid of my interest. So, therefore, that is one that is the call concept of markers for selection. So, there are different antibiotics which can be made resist used, but we will assume that in a standard approach this is ampicillin uh, resistance. So, we will now uh, continue in the next class on the further steps which we need to do uh, to purify and extract the protein and how to label it.